I want to caution, though, against making it strictly a thing about age, because I've had a ton of uh, people who are, you know, uh, 70 plus, 60 plus, uh, you know, 80 plus in some cases, who have been in fandom for decades come up to me and be like, I liked your book. It was really cool reading a fantasy that was set in the Middle East. It was really, I liked this character. This was different. And uh, I just, you know, appreciating the, the story, but also explicitly appreciating the departure from the stories that, uh, that have been told. And, uh, and I've also had shitloads of, uh, you know, uh, 20-somethings on the internet be like, fuck you, terrorist, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. you're ruining our genre, blah. you know, and, and so it's, uh, it doesn't map quite neatly onto a generational <laughs> shift, but I think that a gen the generational and kind of demographic shift has opened up the feel for, e even for folks who maybe have been nurturing some of these sentiments for a while and, and yeah. uh, have been kind of trying to get them out there, but there hasn't been the leverage, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. I'm 57 I, cool. I feel that way. I mean, yeah. You know, like, yeah. I've been around for a long time, and, 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 and yes, I'm, I'm older than you. are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I, I, I feel like looking back at like being a professional in science fiction in the 90s, that I, you know, as somebody who's basically an eat the rich leftist, um, that I, um, you know, put up with a kind of norm normalization of, of, of sort of popular right wing sentiment dominating science fiction and fantasy that uh, just because that's what that's what it was. And I, I really distinctly remember this about four years ago, the, the, I think it was about four years ago, the Nebula ballot uh, that really t just jumped off the pages of the first I saw. It, was, it really did look like a huge generational shift. It was mm -hmm. the first one where it was totally dominated by stuff that was published online. It was yeah. like at least half female. Mm -hmm. um, was, there were several people of color, and, and I was like, holy crap, they, you know, this is. This is like yeah, a completely new and different science fiction and fantasy professional world. Yeah. Um, you know, so, there, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of just older people who now feel a little bit more empowered to uh, um, to, to you know to un unabashedly ex express their uh, you know their views um, and and, um, and 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 the other side of this, I think, the, the, the sad puppy phenomenon is that a lot of people who are used to having a kind of free free ride and having their go unchallenged are suddenly getting challenged and and, and they're being gigantic crybabies about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Patrick's right. I mean, in the late 90s was when I first started uh, submitting stories and, and 1999 was the first short, short story I got published. So I'm, I kind of started my career in this little gap and, and when I first started getting involved in the field and I would talk about diversity or ask about diversity, everyone would say, well, now Octavia Delaney as a person <laughs> <laughs> or a plus ten something get rid of you spell. Right. Like, we've got three of them. What do you want? <laughs> and, we always, and we put them on the same panel every convention. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, when it, was, it was a frustrating and weird time when I was first getting involved in the field because I felt, I felt having you know, discussions like this, very lonely. <laughs> yeah. But um, also now just to see like there's just such a, a breadth of, of interesting, on all sides of interesting fiction is is like enervating to me. I mean, what a, what a great time. I don't know what the canon will be or what survives, but the fact that we're, we're now throwing so much more of it against the wall to see what sticks right, right. is exactly. like yeah. awesome. Like what, uh, just an amazing time to be a reader. I, would. I mean, it's, it's remarkable to think there have probably been a couple dozen Short stories written by people of color in science fiction and fantasy that I haven't read this year. You yeah, I mean? or exactly. Or like I'm actually, so. I'm actually. Yeah. It used to be that I knew every single story and novel by a person yeah, of color no, right, exactly. in the field. Like I could read it all. Right. Cool. And um, well, I'm that, actually now falling behind yeah. on knowing all the authors. Right. Exactly. Which is like no, totally. That's I know that's great. And then there's all these new that, authors that are playing. And that shift's been up. exponential even since I. I mean, I yeah. published my first story only what five years ago, and. Uh, I've seen a shift even in those, those intervening like few years. Kaya Shani Wilson, <coughs> right. like I just read a, a story, it's, a story uh, for the first time, and then was like, "No, this dude's been around like a couple, you know." Yeah, it's the, I'm coming in late. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. yeah just fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, so Kaya Shanti Wilson, you know, the, the reason that we that launched the Tor.com print online novella line with the <coughs> Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps, which is in, and put a big cover with a great big black guy warrior on it. Yeah. Um, we used that as the launch book for a reason, for a perfectly commercial reason. You know, and we were right; it sold very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's, there's, a, there's a commercial considerations here. I mean, and know, I remember being told in the na late '90s, "Don't ever have a, a person of color as your main character." You know, we not we, sell. We disproved that in 1988 and '89 when we did Stephen Barnes' second novel. The first one had been published by Ace, and they 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 Asianified his. Uh, Lions Club. Uh, no. Oh. Or. Um, no, I don't remember. It was, it was his martial arts hero character. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah. 
But uh, yeah, you know, the first one was published by Ace, and they not quite whitewashed, they Asian washed the black guy. Okay. <laughs> and, and we did the second one, we made him a black black guy, and it sold like really well. I mean, it like, turned out that there are a lot of people in the United States who wanted to read about a, a black main character in a science fiction action adventure novel. <laughs> Duh. Right. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 the piece of the, the uh, area. The field of pop culture that actually led the way on this um, uh, the, the actually was more progressive for longer and, and more diverse in its in portrayals and, 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 and range of types of characters, I am ashamed to say because it's totally pathetic, is Marvel and DC. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can see this in, their, in co the comics world's conventions, that, which have been much less lily white um, mm -hmm. for a very long time. Um, and I was going to, you know, comics, because when my wife was brief, briefly working as an editor for Valiant Comics in the mid 90s, I went to a bunch of you know New York City area comics conventions. At that time, you know you could you, know, you couldn't find a person of color at a typical science fiction convention with you know um, a Geiger counter or whatever. But you know, there's lots of them in the, in the Japanese, yeah. just, just tons. Yeah. And that's a, that's yeah that's a pronounced distinction. So you know when you go to a uh, even like Gen Con, the gaming convention, which you see a lot of young people of color. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I sold a lot of books if I go sit at a table at Gen Con. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I believe it. Yeah. All right, we have eighteen minutes left, so I think I will open up to any questions. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Um, I know that everybody's here because we're talking to the authors of books. We've read them, but what about the movies? What about the, how the movies affect? Oh, I was going to say, they do pretty well on their own. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I see what you're saying, yes. yes. Like, yeah. like, my gosh, movies are dying out. We're gonna <laughs> We've got a rally. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just, but, but what I do mean is, is for mind share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there something to discuss about that? Well, I mean, it was mentioned earlier that uh, some of us think that actually movies might be more canon because we've all seen them. I know when I teach in workshops, I tend to use examples from movies because I know for sure that all my students will have actually seen and experienced them and then can understand what I'm saying. Whereas if I use a book, you know, like nine out of ten people in the class will just be like, cricket, yeah. Yeah. you know? Um, and, and since I can't assign the books ahead of time, I basically tend to use movies for almost all my examples of how to do things that are basically canon. and that. That sort of indicates that, uh, in, in many cases, I think that media culture. I mean, just look around at all the signs here. We, Doctor Who signs right. and and all the room parties. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a lot of room parties that are book themed here. Right. No. You know? <laughs> no, but, but, but I mean, it's it's it's, it's interesting. With the, I, I just there's an old idea that just came up in a new picture circulating on Facebook, at least for me, was the iceberg, and they said you know 10 percent, 90 percent, yeah, and the top part it said the movie. And then, you know, the bottom 90% was the book. <laughs> and so I just get that, that angle of it too, because it's like, how does the movie, because it has to cut out so much, affect the canon? And, and, and because you can't have the whole movie being from a perspective of introspection and things like that. I think, well, I, I, I mean, I, it's definitely formally affected. I think um, writers, write like movies a lot more now yeah. probably than they did 50, 60 years ago. Um, uh, and I think that that's, um, I think it's almost inevitable. I mean, it's so, uh, uh, you know, most of us were watching movies and TV before we were reading, you know, and so, um, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I, I don't know how to unmovie my brain at this point, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so I think it probably affects not so much canonicity, but just kind of the, the general form of the novel probably over the past decades has become more more attempted cinematic, I guess. I okay. Well, and when we have so many books that turn into movies, that mm -hmm. also helps to blow the line. Right. I was just going to comment that uh, a lot of very successful movies were actually moved from short stories, mm -hmm. like David Marr and Jordan, Jordan yeah. Cullen and all those things, because yeah. you can encapsulate a lot more of the story. Right. Like Blade Runner was a novel, or Andrew Trimble. Yeah. Like, Um, this is addressed more to Patrick, because we're getting older. Uh, as 
I'm getting older too every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone in the room is doing otherwise, I'd like yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> talk to me after the panel. <laughs> I've been reading science fiction for about 50 years now. I've noticed my tastes have changed. Uh, last summer I reread uh, Glory Road from Heinlein, which is a book I loved way back when. Now it was just. Uh, is that affecting canon in any Sure, of course it is. I, I mean, <laughs> again, Joe Walton has a great, great essay called The Suck Fairy. This <laughs> book must never be reread because you will find that uh, secretly in the night the Suck Fairy has gotten at them. And <laughs> what's great about them is it's now gone and everything was terrible about them. It's, it's front and center. <laughs> Happens to old TV shows you love too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Airwolf does not hold up. Saying you know, we should all cultivate a kind of of, of of ability to project ourselves into the circumstances of the past that you know, things were were written. You know, uh, more sympathy for the past. The, the, the past is dead. It cannot clean up its act. Yeah. Right. You know, um, and and you know there is value in old in old problematic stuff that um. But, you know, but on the other hand, it doesn't mean that you have to spend a lot of time right, reading, uh, reading, you know, like, like a short, you don't have to spend a lot of time reading stuff that you just can't stand. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I really value really good you know, writers and critics like Joe, like Chip Delaney, who wrote the introduction to the current edition of Glory Road, um, who you know, basically are, are capable of that kind of imaginative projection and, and, and te teasing out what's still valid and, and strong. Well, and Chip has been particularly good on Heinlein because you know, there's a, almost nobody in science fiction less like Robert Heinlein. Than <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yet, he, yeah, he is, he, the point he made in his introduction to Glory Road is, you know, Marx's favorite novelist was Balzac, who was a, a huh. royalist, yeah, and, right, and he right. said, and Heinlein's one of mine, you yeah. know. Um, because a uh, couple despite of their writing friends who yeah. absolutely adore China Mabel. Yeah, well, you know, is, yeah, well, po like politics and science fiction, yeah, well, name politics and science fiction doesn't actually have to be a, a, a dead tooth and claw fight to the death. It, it can be, you know, a productive conversation. I mean, writers like Ken McLeod or Stephen Bruce, who, uh, you know, both of whom are different varieties of Trotskyists, um, <laughs> who go out of their way to, to create characters that you, that you will like and sympathize with, who express opinions that are the exact opposite of their own. Um, I think that's a very, you know, that's something that science fiction is particularly well placed to do. Um, yeah. and it, it makes for great conversation in which everybody gets smarter. Indeed. Um, you know, the, I, I wrote an essay about that too, in that, um, you know, like the, as you consume more and more and more books, that has an effect on, on your aesthetic. On your yeah. aesthetics, and you will begin to seek out different things. And one of the things I, I noticed about book bloggers is after about three or four years, they start becoming jaded with everything that's coming across their transom because they've changed their their reading has changed, but they're still reading the same oh. books that they started out. And maybe it's time for them to swap genres, try different things. And I think if you're reading too places. much of uh, too much of your reading is stuff that's coming out right now, you you will, you will eventually burn out certain circuits, mm -hmm. and you'll need you know a deep immersion period of like you know literature of a hundred years ago or something, or or, or, or something totally you know, unrelated like ornithology or Byzantine or whatever. <laughs> During the early two thousands, I was reading big fat space operas and big fat fantasies, and I hit a point where I burned out, and uh, my wife Emily had. Uh, <coughs> Uh, brought home a Harry Potter to read. And at the time, I, I, I had definitely not read a lot of YA since I was of that age myself, but I picked up Harry Potter, which was this like, I think it's like 50, 60,000 words. It's this really compact book that goes from point A to point B very quickly. And read it right then and there um, with just such joy that I kind of went to the YA section with just a hand basket, <laughs> um, you know, and just started uh, putting books in it and taking them home and being like, well, this is just a lot of fun. Um, and just veered off in that direction for my reading for quite a while. Um, and occasionally I'll do that, you know, because it's, that's how you, that's how things stay fresh for you. And, and you discover new genres that you didn't know you would have liked, like, uh, you know, cozy tea mysteries. Or you just, you never know what's going to hit you until you try out lots of different little things. That's about my experience with Harry Potter, too. Yeah? Good. Okay. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, and I missed the beginning of the panel, so you might have addressed this, but it doesn't sound like it. Um, with regard to, you know, golden age fiction versus um, things since then, what are your thoughts on writing style? Because this has come up a lot in conversation this year I, because of the puppies and the marketing to, oh, the wonderful past, blah, blah, blah. Of, um, so much golden age fiction I've tried, and I bounce off the writing within pages. I don't even get to the thing of, you know, are the women cardboard cutouts and cold <laughs> folders? Is everybody, you know, white and Christian? Because, like, 
this prose is unreadable and with a lot of much admired books from 40, 50, 70 years ago. I, I think, I mean, to me, that's, um, that's a part of kind of being forgiving of the past. It's, uh, I mean, it's like movies. Um, most really classic movies, I, I, I think, uh, and I, I know this is kind of blasphemy, but uh, I think there's lots that's um, not great in Casablanca. I think, it, I think there's lots that's, you know, I mean, you, you can find the, the, what looks like craftsmanship to us, I think, uh, changes, you know? And so to, for it to be like bad writing, all, all of our novels are going, all of our prose is going to look stilted. 50 years from now, I think, or, you know, and, and yeah, there's there's those few authors that, like, don't have that problem at all, you know, like, uh, lots of people feel that they can, you know, like, Austin is just immediately readable to people, but I think even the, I think to, to, to only make, to only celebrate the writers, specifically talking about style, to only celebrate the writers who stylistically are most amenable to where we are now, I think is really to lose something, you know, and I think that, um, that, you know, you, you, you have to kind of give Dead writers, the benefit of the doubt that they were they were smart people who had read shitloads themselves and put, you know, and, and now sometimes they were just hammering out a job for a paycheck and they had a week to do it and that's you know that, that's another <laughs> thing, right? But uh, but uh, I mean in general, um, even if the craft at, at the craft level it seems stilted, I guess I try and just kind of embrace that. I mean, me as a reader, you know, I, I I try and embrace that and kind of turn off my 21st century critic brain at the prose level and, and try and uh, try and understand that part of part of what you're encountering might be bad writing and part of it might just be, you know, different languages speaking to each other. Right. Sorry for being in the corner when you can't hear me. So canon, it seems to me, you know, one of my things I really enjoy about science fiction is it, it can occasionally bring out new ideas, things I haven't seen before. And I find that exciting. Canon I would think sometimes pulls us back or holds us back. Do you think that's true, or you know, is there a way for canon to be, you know, explicitly inventing and helping people find new things? I think canon. And we did talk about this at the beginning, where where canon is, it's intensely personal while at the same time being all encompassing, and it's constantly shifting and constantly changing. It's a function of its essence. Uh, yeah, and and we really can't come to one. It seems like. <laughs> So I think, I think it's, it's a constantly changing dialogue, and the, the canon changes always. Was there ever a consensus? Or is that just uh, it's an historical art, I think it's an artificial con yeah. construct. And it, it, it's, it's the idea of that there was a golden age, and we're still talking about the golden age. And, and the point is, yeah, we're in a new golden age, so it changes. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the, the, the simple chronology of when the golden age of science fiction um, it sh it shifts over time. I mean, yeah, that seems to have been the consensus of this panel on several of the questions that we're talking about the 40s and 50s. Right. But you know, 20 years ago it would have been the, 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 30s, the, 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 the very late 30s and the 40s right. and definitely not the 50s. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 Before, before the Campbell's Astounding Magazine, I think at this point we have moved into the period where most of the science fiction published in pulp magazines before Campbell took over Astounding is hard to read. It's hard to read the same way that, you know, the boys' novels by Oliver Optic published in the are hard to read. Yeah, it's just, it's just See, I, th this is clearly but my, I, but my, my nerd hobby horses. I love, I love trying to read that shit. The indecipherability is part of like what turns me on. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, like a sexy accent or something. I have a conversation with Robert Charles Wilson, who, who also has exactly that thing. In fact, his book, Julian Comstock, was completely the result of reading 100 Oliver Optic novels. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you have a not very well-concealed internet aquarium. I, oh, yeah, no, I do, very much so. Yeah. Yes, there's a question back there. Um, well, you know, we talk about canon and shifting canon and that, but it seems like with, with science fiction, there really is kind of a hard line when the idea of space travel gave way to the reality of us actually making it to space. Or did you, although you also said you see cyberpunk, which is... Yeah, well, I mean, consider this. I, 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 my first memory of, of space travel is of uh, the shuttle blowing up. That's the first time I was kind of like, oh, that's how good we are at it. Um, and that pretty much was like where I started. 
Uh, so we've pretty much been going like up since then, in my estimation. There was no lost age where we went to the moon and came back and didn't succeed and all this other stuff that I hear. For me, it's always been like, well, we've been doing a lot better since then. Uh, not to trivialize it, but like that was literally my first thing. So when I read Cyberpunk, which, which kind of took us out of space and said like, this isn't really a thing that's going to define our science fiction. It's all about blue collar stuff and large corporations and smaller countries struggling to survive amongst the larger ones. Like that all kind of was to me like obvious canon. Like, I mean, that, that seemed to reflect the world I was growing up in and seemed to make a lot of sense. And it, 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 it hit me in a way that science fiction hadn't hit me before then, in, in a way that it was kind of like, oh, this is talking about real stuff. Um, and so I, I think those, those are all the things that swirl around and, and make it so. So for me, in my head, it's always been, that's been the golden age. Was the, 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 I'll tell you what the golden week was. It was the week I read Neuromancer, Islands in the Net and a Fire Upon the Deep, all in four days. Oh. And I've never been able to recover from it. <laughs> <laughs> and your head is still spinning. <laughs> well, I, most people couldn't read a Fire Upon the Deep by itself in four days. <laughs> it was a little, I did not get a lot of sleep. <laughs> hey, so uh, three minutes left. Closing comments? I, I, on, the, on the space thing, I, I, I just want to say I actually think that it was written science fiction and popular science fiction. We are now something like three or four iterations of reaction and counter-reaction um, past the, you know, the, 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 the decline of the American space program. You know, I mean, so the, 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 both the Martian and the movie and, and the Expanse are, are a, a expressions of, of interest in a, in a future in which we are, after, after all, you know, colonizing the solar system and so forth. Um, um, and, and there will be reactions against that. Um, you know, Charlie Strauss is a one-man crusade for, we're not going to space, but you're crazy. <laughs> And uncomfortable. <laughs> I, think, uh, yeah, I think we're good. Thank you so much, Charlie.